This is the lecture for Ancient and Medieval History for Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. And Alexander the Great has conquered the dominant power in the East while ruling the dominant power in the West. This is a unique accomplishment to be Lord of East and West. And he did it all at a remarkably young age. His talents for reading the land and for reading the people around him, both his followers and his enemies, led him to a series of victories which caused the last Darius king of Persia to abdicate in favor of Alexander when Alexander married his daughter. Alexander then tried conquering India, but his men were so terrified of what they believed they knew about the equatorial regions, and frankly, they were simply homesick. They had signed on to conquer Persia. Most of them didn't really think they would, and then they did. They wanted to stop this never-ending conquest, because sooner or later your number's up in battle. You can only have so many lucky breaks. So for the only time, Alexander has to accept a limit on his ambition. He turns around and goes back to Persia and dies. The Greek generals who serve him are horrified when Alexander dies at age 33. This doesn't seem to be an assassination. Of course, it may have been a very, very well-planned assassination, but it doesn't seem to be one. In any event, the generals divide up the empire. Seleucus takes the east, Antiochus, Greece, and Asia Minor, mostly Asia Minor. <clears throat> Ptolemy takes Egypt. That's Ptolemy with a silent P. <clears throat> These Diadochi kingdoms are going to dominate the Middle East for the next few hundred years uh, into early Roman times. Greece itself is going to become divided and once again interpolis politics, the squabbling among Greek city-states, um, make Greece an ongoing cauldron of bubbly crisis and irritability. So, this power vacuum that exists in Greece, <clears throat> well, nature abhors a vacuum. You create a vacuum tube, pump out all the air, make it strong enough to withstand the air pressure, and then pop it and it will implode. I've done it, I know. It's fun. Really expensive. So. And these days, even more so, because they don't make vacuum tubes anymore. If you have weakness in human history, that weakness invites attack. If you project strength, most of the time, predators will leave you alone. I learned this in New York City on the subways. <clears throat> if you walk around looking afraid, looking timorous, <clears throat> or looking like a tourist, ooh, ah, either way, <clears throat> you're not paying attention to your environment, your surroundings, and the people in your surroundings. <clears throat> if you're ever trapped in an alley <clears throat> with your date by a mugger, and you don't want to pay, you can say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, here, have all my money and my credit cards. Or you can say, don't hurt me, take the girl. <laughs> or you can say, oh God, don't let me kill again. <laughs> That's the one you say, if you can pull it off, because you don't want to protect weakness. So you walk in the city 
like a predator. If you walk like a predator, <clears throat> with the body language of a predator, you deter attack. It doesn't make you proof. It's not like a magic shield, but you deter attack. <clears throat> because most bullies are cowards, and most predators aren't up for a fight. They want lunch, not the greatest battle of their lives. And so if you project strength, awareness, danger, they will tend to find weaker prey. But Greece is not projecting strength. Greece is projecting division and bitterness and all of the stuff that made Philip conquer it in the first place. So, the Greeks begin to get these <clears throat> visitors, merchants, tourists, from the west, from an Italian place called Rome, just north of Magna Graecia. And <clears throat> the thing about the Romans is they have this notion that they're all free. <clears throat> Excuse my throat. I didn't get much sleep last night. And they don't like it when their citizens are molested. <clears throat> Especially by effeminate pipsqueak Greek kings. So, again and again, the Greeks make the mistake of treating the Romans like <clears throat> barbarians. <clears throat> and from 280 BC through 30 BC, Rome pays Greece back by conquering it bit by bit. And the Spartans try their phalanx against Rome's legions. It doesn't work. At this point, the Greeks have been eclipsed by the Romans. <clears throat> oh, that'll help. And you know this because the Romans don't become part of the Spartan Empire. Spartans and all the rest of Greece become part of the Roman Empire. So <clears throat> Rome marches east because of the power vacuum created by, once again, divided Greece squabbling. In fact, the Diodaki kingdoms are squabblers too, and the Romans are going to take <clears throat> everything but the eastern Seleucid Empire. So, that's the political situation that we've covered from in detail from the Greco-Persian War in 490 BC to the Roman conquest of Greece in the couple of centuries preceding Jesus' birth. Now we're going to look at Greek culture. And we're going to start with Hellenism. <clears throat> you should know that Hellenism is the blending of the best of Greek and Persian culture, whatever that means. The blending of the best of Greek and Persian culture, that's Hellenism. It comes from Hellas, which is what the Greeks call themselves after the Homer, Homeric epics, the Hellenes, uh, which relates to Helen of Troy and the story of the pursuit of her to Troy and beyond. When I say that Hellenism lists, lasts to this day, I mean two things by that. First of all, the notion of blending cultures is very much alive and well. In fact, <clears throat> one of the things that liberals and conservatives could agree on for most of my life was that one of the glorious things about being in America is it didn't matter where your family was from, what your genetics were. You could go to an Italian uh, restaurant for lunch, a Chinese restaurant for dinner. You could uh, dress up for anything you want on Halloween. Um, you could read Japanese literature, listen to Indian sitar music. We, thanks to the modern world and the Pax Americana, have access to all the world's cultures. <clears throat> and because we're America, 
we have people from all over the world bringing their culture here. Now, conservatives didn't take this as far as liberals. Conservatives said it's great. We can sample from the world's cultures and we can glean the most interesting things like going to a smorgasbord and just taking what you want. Liberals and progressives <clears throat> embrace the idea of multiculturalism, which is a reduction in our identity as Westerners, members of Western civilization, Christian Western civilization, Judeo-Christian Western civilization, and more citizens of the world. In fact, I remember having hammer and tongs arguments with other history teacher teachers from other schools when I taught back in Maine, because their school actually had as part of their slogans, we are building global citizens. And they tried that in the school I taught, and it didn't happen while I was there, because we're not freaking global citizens. We're citizens of the United States of America. And that's a proud heritage. And it's a heritage that anyone in the world can take part in. It's not about blood or soil. It's about loyalty to the values for which that flag stands. It's about freedom and loyalty to the Constitution, about individual rights, and about working our way towards a more perfect union. All of these things <clears throat> are part of the Western experience. They come out of Greece, Rome, the Christian faith and Jewish faith, and the Germans that conquer Rome. And they all percolate for a thousand years in Europe. It is a wonderful thing to embrace Confucianism from China and Buddhism from India and some Shinto ideas from Japan. It's a wonderful thing to leaven and cultivate yourself with the ideas that other civilizations have taken to heart. But the idea of giving up our identity as Westerners to become some kind of new amalgam hybrid global citizen has never made sense to me. Because the institutions that keep us free are rooted in a Western understanding of things. And if you abandon that understanding of things, freedom will soon go bye-bye, in my humble judgment. So, <clears throat> the idea of blending cultures is usually a good thing, to whatever extent. <clears throat> Within the last five years, of course, the left has surprised me by embracing notions of cultural appropriation. That if you're not a Pacific Islander, you, you can't dress up your daughter up as Moana on Halloween, or um, you, know, you, you, can't eat, you can't start a Chinese restaurant unless you're ethnically Chinese, which to me is racist. Oh, you've got to be a certain ethnic group in order to eat a certain type of food? What, <clears throat> do I have to be a sausage slurping? sauerkraut eating German in order to enjoy beer or Oktoberfest? Do I have to? I, you get the idea. I've never understood it. <clears throat> I've had people in my class, students and families, who deeply believed in it. Uh, we didn't agree. We had to agree not to agree because their logic did not impress me. My logic did not impress them. In any event, before cultural appropriation, which I don't think is going to last, the idea of sampling the best of the world's cultures was a very, not only American, the British did it, the Germans did it, the Australians did it, the Japanese did it. What do the Japanese call that box that you watch? Televis. Japanese manga and anime, they're as a result of Western influence, particularly of American influence. And I could go on. I mean, <clears throat> anyway, the idea of blending cultures is very much alive and well. But an example from the ancient world of Hellenism is Christianity. <clears throat> Christianity is Hellenistic. Yeah, in this sense. Before Christ, the Jewish tradition is an Eastern tradition. It's an Asian tradition. Israel is in Western Asia. They went to Africa briefly done it during the time of the Egyptian slavery, but in general terms, 
The history of the uh, Israelites is a history of a Western Asian people. It has more to do with the history of the Arabs than anyone else, which is one of the reasons why they fight so intensely. They're very similar to one another culturally. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And if you become a minister, as a friend of mine has, <clears throat> one of the things you do is you learn enough Hebrew to at least read the Bible in the original language, the Old Testament. The New Testament, the story of Jesus and of the early Christian faith, that's not written in Hebrew. And it's not written in the language Jesus spoke. Jesus spoke a language called Aramaic, which is a language that has died. Aramaic, you can learn it in a, in a, in a, in a seminary, but it's not a, it, you know, it's, it is not a language that has persisted. And Aramaic was sort of a patois of a variety of different kinds of languages. There are a few Aramaic words. One of the most moving moments in the Bible for me is Jesus is brought to a young woman about your age, who uh, may be a little younger than you, who uh, is bleeding to death. And he heals her and says, Arise, maiden. And the original Aramaic is kept in the in the Bible. It says, Talitha Kuni. Talitha Kuni. Arise, maiden. Talitha is maiden. Now, the New Testament is written in Greek. Not Hebrew. Not Aramaic. But Greek. And after the death, and if you believe, resurrection of Jesus... Most of the disciples and apostles try to convert the Jewish world. But for the most part, the Jewish world rejects Jesus. He doesn't fit their picture of a Messiah. We're going to go into a lot of this in a lot more detail later. You know who accepts the idea? Greeks. And to a lesser degree, Romans. Why? Why? Because the Olympian gods no longer satisfactorily explain the meaning of life. The upper class of the Greek and Roman worlds don't believe in the gods except as using religion as a tool to help politics. So before a battle, they'll have a priest slaughter a bull or whatever, and uh, they'll read the entrails. Oh, if we are brave, we will have victory in battle. I mean, uh, the priesthood was sort of a a propaganda tool for the leadership. But most people in the time of Christ didn't believe, really deeply believe in the wisdoms of Zeus. They did it because it was expected, because it was their patriotic religion, the faith of their fathers. When Christianity comes, it adds an entirely new depth of dimension to religion. First of all, Christ didn't just come for the Jews. Secondly, Christ didn't just come for wealthy, powerful men. Christ came for all people, men, women, children, free, wealthy, and slave. This universal message that God isn't a distant engineer creating a universe he doesn't care about, but that God actually cares about us as individuals, <laughs> it catches in the Greek world like wildfire to such a degree that the Romans end up feeling the need to suppress it. The Romans, who are normally very religiously tolerant, target Christianity for well over 200 years as a chief threat to the Roman way of life because it's spreading so effectively. Christianity has a mixture of Hebrew ideas about God and life and Greek ideas about God and life. It is absolutely Hellenistic in that it blends those two. It's not quite as individualistic as Greek ideas, but it focuses more on an inner life than does the Jewish law, which is concerned with how you behave, not what you believe, beyond a certain point. So, <clears throat> Hellenism very much alive and well. Alexander's blend didn't create an empire that lasted. But for the most part, 
from around 300 years before Christ to about 600 years after. That's almost a thousand years. Alexander's Hellenistic model dominates Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern societies. And even Islam, when it takes over, even though it comes out of Arabia, Islam, when it takes over the old Persian Empire, takes on a lot of Hellenistic ideas. In fact, a lot of the Greek knowledge that's destroyed when the German barbarians take over the Roman Empire become part of Arab knowledge. And a thousand years ago, Arab scientists building on this Greek knowledge were the most advanced in the world. That has changed. So, any questions, comments, or thoughts on culture or Hellenism before I move on? details. And again, I apologize for my voice, voice being raspy and for clearing my throat a lot. Apparently in the middle of the night I had a bad dream and I yelled loud. Occasionally that happens and I heard, I heard my voice. So, what I really need is a jelly donut because they're supposedly, I learned this from Rush Limbaugh, but it actually works. Uh, so I may go out and get one period two. I don't know. Gross donuts has good donuts. Uh, but uh, jelly donuts do tend to grease the boozle. I'm that one. What's that boozle like? It's, it's a legend. Anyway, Greek culture. Okay, we've gone over this. I'm just hitting it again. The Athenian idea of demokratia, where the people rule, democracy, is a great tradition that the Greeks pass on to us. We don't live in a democracy, but we have an idea, uh, we have some democratic ideals. For example, every American should have a vote. Every American can have an opinion. Every American should have the widest possible choices and freedoms. That's why we have a Bill of Rights. This all comes from the democratic principle that every citizen has value and something to offer. That's a good thing. Because what that means is our society trusts you more than it trusts the government to make the big decisions in life. Each of you. <clears throat> Some of you will be worthy of that trust. Some of you will not, at least for a while. In fact, I would suspect that at one time or another in your life, all of you will not be worthy of that trust, just as at times in my life, I was not worthy of that trust. I guess what I'm saying is sometimes as we're learning how to handle freedom, it's a little too much for us, and we make stupid decisions. That's part of growing up. Solon creates the uh, uh, first democratic constitution in Athens that is designed to break the power of the upper class of the aristocracy and increase the power of every citizen. So Solon's constitution is against the aristocracy. Cleisthenes then comes along about 50, 60, 70 years later, and he develops a constitution that is designed not only to empower every citizen, but to reduce corruption. To reduce corruption. We've talked a lot about warfare. I guess what I want you to remember about Greek warfare is the Greeks while we think of them as philosophers and experimenters and creative artists, they invent theater, you know, they, they invent philosophy, at least they develop philosophy in ways nobody else had up till that point. They, they invent geometry, they develop science. But the Greeks are good at war for much of their history. By the time Rome comes along, that's been beaten out of them. But for the most part, the Greeks are good at war, and as you've read the Iliad or are reading the Iliad, you know that they glorify it. They like it. When Alexander in that movie says, what you will remember is that you fought for the honor and glory of Greece. Glory, look, I guess the idea behind glory is this. We all live and then we die. That's a universal. But not all of us leave important memories behind us. Not all of us make courageous decisions that are going to be talked about after we die. 
Many Greeks believed that a person was immortal so long as people still talked about them after they died. So the idea of Odysseus still being alive because people talk about him is pretty powerful. Hi. I don't know. He's, a, he's okay, I think. Um, just deciding whether or not he needs somebody to fall. Yeah. Why don't blame me? No, it's me, I think. Yeah, he was locked. Yeah. They didn't even have the satisfaction. <laughs> That's, it's so long. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm also, my sense of humor is a little off today. Um, warfare, glory, the Iliad, you, you get it. War is considered to be something that allows a person to live a life worth remembering. You could be poor as dirt. You could be a commoner. Your father could have been the least of the people of your town. But if you in battle do something remarkable and heroic, your name could echo through the ages. That's glory. And the Greeks are not ashamed of it. Our society, after two world wars, a cold war, a bunch of medium-sized war, and the war on terror, our society is, is programmed to look at glory, look askance at it, and say, grow up. But the Greeks didn't feel that way. The Greeks thought glory was truly a worthwhile thing. Even if it cost you your life, you gained immortality by doing something glorious. Greek warfare involves these set-piece battles where you've got heavy infantry and light infantry and maybe some horse scouts, cavalry, and you move them across open ground in organized formations. This is a quintessentially Mediterranean way of fighting. The Persians actually are used to a more open form of warfare. They learn how to do this. But their armies are always less organized than the Greeks. One of the interesting scenes in that battle is you've got a perfect phalanx of pikemen marching, and then the flag, guy with the flag who they follow slowly moves this way, and the entire square turns and keeps moving. So the phalanx is moving forward, and then slowly everyone turns at the same rate and moves up at a diagonal. Now that's not an easy thing to train, because men, you may have noticed, are of different heights, so you've got to teach the soldiers how to march at the same rate, with the same pace, and to move in the same way to keep the formation. And they learned how to do it. Linking shields to block arrows, they learned how to do it. So Mediterranean warfare is a product of having all this open ground. In a forested region, like the Celts lived in up in northern Europe and the Germans lived in, their forms of warfare were a lot more open formation, basically a lot more individualistic, because you can't move a phalanx through a forest and keep the formation. It just won't work. Philosophy. A lot of people think that philosophy is this frou-frou activity that real people don't engage in. That it's like, if you're a cultural Philistine, it's like ballet. You know, real men don't watch ballet. That's not true, actually. Uh, and ballerinas and uh, male ballet dancers, I don't know what they're called. I know ballerinas are female ballet dancers, are some of the best athletes in the world. I mean, they are incredi in incredible shape to do some of the stuff they do. Very little body fat on them. Philosophy is this. First of all, it comes from two words. Philo, which is one of the several Greek words for love, and Sophia, which means wisdom. So if you know anyone named Sophie, uh, her name means wisdom. Philo, Sophia. The love of wisdom. And what Philo, Sophia is, 
is thinking about thinking in a focused manner. Thinking about thinking in a focused manner. Philosophy is thinking about thinking in a focused manner. What the heck does that mean? Okay. Okay. My wife and I have been together since January of 1985. We've been married since July of 1990. We got married with five sets of friends that summer. I had five friends, each of whom got married. Many were mutual friends. There's only one other couple that's still married. The other three couples divorced fairly quickly. For whatever reason, people my age, the age of your parents, were not always able to keep their marriages together. And that's not a failing on anyone's part. It's just the way things are. Sometimes it's better to be out of a relationship than in a toxic one. I grew up in a divorced household, so I'm not being critical. I'm simply pointing out. One of the things that probably made it easier for Tina and I to stay together is that we didn't have children. When you have children, you're under incredible pressure to keep those kids alive and raise them right. We didn't have that. We have cats. It's much easier. But another thing is that we are very careful how we fight. Every couple fights. That's normal for human beings. There are things we care about, and sometimes we just rub each other the wrong way, and we get angry. Now, on television and in popular culture and in movies, people score points off one another. They rip into one another. They go for victory. And I've seen this in my own life. Early on, Tina and I agreed that we would, to the best of our ability, not do that. First of all, when we got married... I vowed to love, honor, and cherish. She vowed to love, honor, and obey. Every couple's different. I don't expect that many or any of you would follow our example, but we're both traditionalists. And what it meant was that in the end, I would have the final say. And that helped me grow up because I had another life in my hands. And I could, I could force my way because she promised, and she meant it. I had to be worthy of that trust. I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense, but I'm telling you, it makes sense to me. When you get married like that, you have to be worthy of the other person's love to the best of your ability, and you have to try to be a trustworthy and responsible individual. Most people, when they get married, are young, and they're half adolescent and half adult. Marriage helps you grow up. If you have children, God, you grow up. We decided that to the best of our ability, when we realized that we were ripping at each other angrily, we would stop. And we'd come back later when we're calm and work it out, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not. That we wouldn't fight angry. And this is something I've heard from parents that discipline their children in an old-fashioned way. It's not a terrible thing to spank your child, as long as you don't do it while you're angry. You can look angry, you can make the child think you're angry, but a spanking is not supposed to be about anything other than getting the child's attention. Once you've got the child's attention, you convey the lesson. These people who reason with three-year-olds are just they're crazy as far as I'm concerned. I mean, maybe it works for them. The idea of sitting a child down, a child whose brain is not yet capable of reasoning and expecting them to reason, doesn't make sense to me, like so many other things. We try not to fight angry, and we try to solve the problem. We try not to compete with one another. We try to be harmonious. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. She's not perfect. We screw up. But we try really hard <coughs> to fight well. So that in addition to the trauma caused by the emotional upset, we don't make it worse by ripping at one another with claws and knives, spiritual wounds. We think about how we fight. We think about how we talk about one of the things. And one of the strange things about the way we talk sometimes 
is we're not talking about the problem anymore. We talk about how we're talking about the problem. Does that make sense? We talk about how we're talking about the problem. We discuss the ground rules that we're going to use. It's really weird. But it keeps us most of the time from hurting one another because we're angry. And it keeps us on the straight and narrow in terms of keeping the argument about solving the problem. Philosophy is a lot like that. In philosophy, you're not really thinking about the meaning of life as much as you're thinking about how you're going to think about the meaning of life. What, what is life? What is meaning? This is not stupid to think. These are not stupid things to ask. What is life? What is meaning? What do you mean by life? Do you mean human life? Do you mean emotional? Do you mean intellectual? Do you mean spiritual? Do you mean physical? What is meaning? Is meaning opinion? Is meaning objective fact? Philosophy is going through all of these things using reason and logic to try to make sense. So that when you start talking about the problem, because you've come up with all of these definitions and ground rules, what you're going to do is going to produce something thoughtful and worthwhile. Instead of just being wild and crazy and grunting, the words you use are going to be precise. They're going to mean things. And what you're going to discuss is going to be precise. <laughs> Ultimately, this is going to produce both geometry and the scientific method. The idea of logically working your way from start to finish through a problem comes from philosophy, from the love of wisdom. Thinking about thinking about a problem. There's another great definition for philosophy that I'm going to give you in addition to thinking about thinking about the problem, and that definition is philosophy is the study of consequences. Philosophy is the study of consequences. Philosophy is the study of consequences. And what that means is that philosophy is the study of how certain decisions inexorably lead to certain results. If you walk into a high crime area with money bulging out of your pocket, looking at the tops of the buildings and acting like you don't have a care in the world, there are desperate people in that high crime neighborhood. Because I used to live in a few. And because they need to, or because you're presenting an antelope-like opportunity to their lions, they will take you. And they may kill you in the process. Because you make them angry. Because you're walking around casually flaunting something that they desperately need and don't have. And envy is one of those emotions that's pretty darn powerful in us. Hell, communism is based on the principle of envy. If you walk around fla flaunting your wealth among poor people, you might think that you're doing good. Maybe you are. But I've seen people at soup kitchens who are very comfortable and are very smarmy. They don't mean to be. They're at the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving helping out because they care. I honor that. I haven't done that very often in my life. I've obviously done it once or twice because I wouldn't be able to talk about it if I hadn't. But it isn't. It isn't my thing. And a lot of these people go to the soup kitchen once a week as part of their sense of helping the community. But there is this sense that some people have when they're working at the soup kitchen of entitlement, that they are giving back. And that just tends to rub people the wrong way. I can't explain it. I'm trying to explain something subtly about the way human beings react, rightly or wrongly. Sometimes we bite the hand that feeds us. Literally, sometimes. Philosophy, because it is so methodical, because it thinks about how you're going to think, tries to draw clear con 
connections between decisions and effects, causes and effects, decisions and consequences. And if you understand those things, you can be a better leader, a wiser person. These are the benefits of philosophy. Now, philosophy is also a bit like the Greek snake Ouroboros, the snake swallowing its own tail. There are some philosophers that just love to hear the sound of their own voice. I know, as a man who loves to hear the sound of my own voice, I can recognize it in others. And sometimes they just argue these arcane points because it's fun. And they do it with other philosophers because nobody else has the patience for it. But philosophy does have uses. I've tried to list them. Now, the wise guys. The wise guys, and I mean that like in a mafia sense. The wise guys are the sophists. And the sophists are a movement in Greek philosophy that is also a career choice. The sophists, what these guys do is they go around from police to police and they speak in the agora. And they speak with the intent of making a lot of money. People come to hear these guys. They're famous speakers. And what they will do is they will make pretzels out of logic for fun. They will use their cleverness to prove that falsehood equals truth, that darkness equals light. And it's entertaining the way they do it. The good ones make money. So the sophists are professional philosophers who are like stand-up comedians or snake oil salesmen who go from town to town making their speeches and making their money and showing how logic is just a tool. Guns don't kill people. I do. Logic doesn't prove Logic is a tool in my hands. I can turn logic. <laughs> oh, gosh. I can make people break up in their relationships. I can destroy friendships. I can get, make faithful people doubt their gods. If only for a little while, because I am a master of logic. Now, this I call logic abuse. Okay, it is the abuse of power. There's the French idea of noblesse oblige. In Spider-Man, it's translated as with great power comes great responsibility. These guys have great power. They're really, sh they're whip smart. I mean, they're, they're smart and they're good speakers. And what do they use it for? Making people's minds go, snap. And they make money doing it. And the people go to them because it's fun. It's entertaining. It's like, yeah, you have a new toy. And that toy is how do you use logic to prove that the wrong is right? <laughs> oh, gosh. Watch out. <clears throat> now, there are various ways that people react to hearing things, like from the sophists. One way I don't have written in your notes is you could be credulous. Credulous. I'll write that down. Credulous. C-R-E-D-U-L-O-U-S. Credulous. Hmm. What does that mean? Yeah? You're like, what is going on here? Kind of a uh, big reaction. Um. Close. You, that can be the emotional effect. A credulous person believes what they're told. Incredulous. Incredulous is what you talked about. Okay. Credulous is a person who believes what they're told. I've got some swamp land in Florida that I'd love to sell you. It's beautiful. Okay, uh, let me give you my life savings. A credulous person. I just saw some fairies playing around outside. They have beautiful gossamer wings and little sparkly wands like Tinkerbell. Oh, really? How cool is that? Let's go see. <laughs> I'm, right now, the evil part of me is tempted to make a bunch of political jokes, but I won't, because that would be wrong. All I can say is, 
we have an inflation problem where there's so much money in the economy that each dollar is worth less and less. So I'm going to try to pass a trillion dollar spending bill that's going to somehow solve the problem by introducing a trillion more dollars into the market. <coughs> Still back there. Anyway, yeah. Theoretically, if you had to make a deal that was political based, I just, I just, I just sort of did. Oh. <laughs> I just sort of did. The idea that in an inflationary environment, you're going to inject a trillion dollars of printed money that isn't based on anything, and that that's going to do anything other than continue to cripple the value of each dollar is laughable. It's like saying, okay. We're playing a game and we're kids and we're playing for candy. And suddenly a guy comes in who had saved and frozen his Halloween candy and drops it on the table. And that's going to be part of the game now. We're gambling for candy, like candy poker. Each piece of candy, which used to be coveted, is now just, just a piece of candy because you get these bags of Halloween candy flooding the market. Does that make any sense? I hope. In any case, I see, I wasn't vicious. I chose not to be. Because I'm not a sophist. A credulous person believes what they're told. Then there's skepticism, which is something educated people are encouraged to be. Skepticism <clears throat> says, maybe, just maybe, they're not right. Maybe the swampland in Florida might not be as good as they say. Maybe instead of fairies, what I'm seeing are dragonflies. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about where money is concerned. Maybe. So because it is possible that what somebody is telling me might not be correct, even if they think it is, I'm going to think for myself. That's skepticism. You've got swampland in Florida. I want to see pictures. I want to talk to eyewitnesses. I want to look at the local uh, flood charts and see if it's in a floodplain. I want to know how many alligators there are on the land, or at least if there are alligators. I want to know if it's, a, if it's like a crack house that I'm buying. Uh, you know, with with an organized crime or operation there, I want to know. I want to know facts. Okay, you saw fairies. Do you have any photographs? Do you have like a picture of Bigfoot running into the forest, which is the classic Bigfoot picture? You know, guy in a suit running into a forest. He looks like Bigfoot. Um, what about those UFOs? They're always blurry in the photographs, or they look like pie plates that you've thrown into the air with little antenna put on them. Maybe there's a reason for that. Yes, the aliens have a way of blurring film. The fairies' magic make it impossible for them to be photographed. Their photographs always show them as dragonflies, but they're really fairies. You just have to see them with the wonder of a child. A skeptic will find a way to think for themselves. So I assume that you have the capacity for help for a, a what's called a healthy skepticism. So I say something about President Biden. And you know I'm a conservative who doesn't particularly like the policies of President Biden. And I, I've never liked him personally. I, I've known about Joe Biden since the 70s, and I've never liked what I saw. So <clears throat> let's see. If you hear something from me about Biden or about the women's, or about any of the things I go on about, maybe instead of just accepting what I'm saying is true, you will think for yourself. Oh, that Mr. Genorio, he's a dinosaur, he's a conservative, he, he, he doesn't understand what it's like, he doesn't understand the modern world. And all of these things are true to an extent. The question is to what extent? I don't want you to believe everything I say about ideas. I want you to get upset with me and argue so that your ideas can develop as you, in, you know, as they will naturally within you. I've always said that's my goal. That really is my goal. I do not want a bunch of mind-numb conservative robots walking out of my classroom. 
And I hope that I don't do that. And if I do, I, I've just got to be more stupid and goofy because then I won't, you know, I won't sell my ideas. I'll just, I'll show you what my ideas lead to. If they lead to me. You don't want any part of them. <laughs> then there's the cynic. While the skeptic suspects the possibility that somebody may be wrong or, or somebody may be lying to them, a cynic knows that anyone who talks about truth is a lying scumbucket who's trying to cheat, cheat you, who's trying to trick you. It's a trap. Don't ever listen to anyone who tells you about morality or truth or justice or logic because they're stinking liars. They're manipulative jerks. A cynic knows that there is no truth, that there is no reason, that there is no right, except what they personally believe, and that all politicians are liars, and all doctors are liars, and all lawyers are liars, and all teachers are liars, trying to trap your free mind in their lies. Yep, that's a cynic which I think is a cheap and easy way out. If all politicians are liars, you don't need to pay attention to politics. If all people who spout about ideas are, are trying to use and manipulate you and take advantage of you, then you don't have to listen to anyone. You can just reject all of it. It's so easy. It's a little cowardly in my judgment. Yeah, but... You're a teacher, so nothing you say matters. What you call cowardice, I call bravery, man. Okay. Call it what you will. So, how do people respond to the sophists? Some of them are credulous. Okay, I believe what they say. Some of them are cynical. You dirty, lying jerk. And some of them are skeptical. I think I'm going to take what you say into account, but I'm going to see for myself. I'm going to look out the window for the fairies, and I'm going to take a trip down to Florida to look at the uh, swampland. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Thank you for your attention. You may talk quietly until dismissal. Hold on.